Welcome back. This is the Tutor Wizard. I'm Adrian. Please subscribe right here. Hit the notification bell. You'll get notifications for our linear algebra series and a bunch of other ones on our channel. What we're doing is obviously I just said it linear algebra. We're doing chapter one, which is systems of equations. The first section will just be an introduction to linear systems and what we mean by that. What is a linear equation and what's a system of linear equations. And then we're going to start off specifically in this lecture of just doing motivating examples as why I would want to do something like this. Okay, we're just going to do a couple examples and we're going to start fleshing out ad hocly what we would have in these word problem games and why we're going to want to systematically phrase something called algebra and then an equation and then possibly more than one variable and then more than one equation and then what we're talking about by a system of linear equations. What does linear mean? First of all, let's look at an example. These are all going to be linear because I want to phrase motivating examples using linear equations. I have an item which is bought jointly because they couldn't afford one on their own. And then they don't tell us how much it is. Why don't we just ask the guy how much it is and then we wouldn't have to do the problem. Stop wrecking my math problems. If each person pays eight coins, is that the only information you're given? Then there's a surplus of three coins. If seven people pay, there's a deficiency of four coins. Find the number of people and the cost of the items. Before we systematically phrase, and I'll even show you possibly ad hocly what we're going to do with this, I'll just give you the starting idea of what I do to take this rhetoric or the word problem and start using the power of algebra to phrase what's going on in here because you're like, I didn't follow what's going on, I'm lost. I was lost after you said jointly and then I was thinking about something else entirely. It's like, no, stop. Pay attention. <laughs> First of all, what you want to do is, it talks about people. It says, find the number of people. I'm going to call that something. I don't care what you call it, but then we'll have algebra and then we can put them into equations. And then it says we're also going to have the cost of the item. So I need to find the number of people N, let's call it, and the cost C or P for people and C for cost. It's not very imaginative. We're not imaginative in our labeling. We're imaginative in our solutions. Therefore, I'm going to say let N be the number of people and I'm going to let C be the cost of the item. Now I have algebra. Now what I want to do is use the sentences to try and create equations. Also when we do this you can sometimes you set it up and you might get it wrong slightly but the logic of the equation when it doesn't work out that tells you that you didn't set it up quite right so it still gives you a check mentally. Now what I'm going to do from here is try to say well how am I going to where's the pieces of information where there's an equal sign. They're telling me there's got to be uh, this thing somewhere, probably two of them, and that's the two sentences. So now what I have to do is take those sentences and create equations which are going to have those in there. Where do I get that? If I had 8 times n, the number of people I had, if they paid 8 coins times the number of people I had, that would be the cost plus 3, a surplus. And again, if I thought it was a minus 3 or something, if we try that, but then something will go wrong, you'll be like, oh, you have negative people, and that tells you that you've set things up wrong. The second sentence says, 7 coins times the number of people will end up giving me the total cost of the item, but I'll be short 4. So that's the minus myth will be a deficiency of 4. So this is usually the hardest part, taking their words and their rhetoric and turning it into equations. Now, if there's any justice in the world, these are linear, which they are, and I have two pieces of unknowns. I have two equations therefore. I'm not going to show you the systematic method that we phrase this and put it into our linear system of two equations and two unknowns then use Gaussian Jordan elimination to augment this to Robert echelon form and then give the unique solution. What? We're going to do that over this course. Right now what I'm going to do is just see that we could cleverly find C by doing this. If I notice in this equation that C is equal to 8n minus 3 and in this equation, C is equal to 7n plus 4. Then I use transitivity of equality and I set those two things equal to each other. Let's move that up. If I now see that 8n minus 3 is equal to C, which is equal to 7n plus 4, I can now have, and this is the crux, everyone laughs at first, but now this is be one equation and one unknown, and that's what we're going to do to solve all linear systems. I'm even doing it right now. Cleverly doing this, I've eliminated C from the equations. I now have one equation and one unknown. This is now says, 8n minus 3 equals 7n plus 4, which says what? We're going to get 8n minus 7n equals 4 plus 3, which says 
n is equal to 7. It didn't even make us divide or anything on one side where this became a multiple. Now, because I had that, I had one equation and one unknown, so the strategy always is when we're solving for n, move n to one side, move everything to the other side, and solve for n. Now that I have that, what is that going to say for us? Using this equation, c is going to be 7 times 7 plus 4, which is 53. Therefore, we have, in some strange ad hoc way, found a way of taking these sentences, setting up a system of two equations and two unknowns, doing something to it to find that we had a unique solution of seven people, and the cost of the item was 53, both of which are prime numbers, most likely why I picked it. Let's do one more. I thought you would like this one because you don't get to eat any of them. Birds are friends, not food. Okay, they might, well, I might give you one. She wanted to get closer at the hundreds fowl problem. Yes, a fowl is a bird, and yes, we're going to talk about how many birds we get. You're, we're bringing a hundred home, and you're not going to get to eat any of them. Okay? Example two is going to be the hundreds fowl problem. It's circa 450 BC. So this is a 2,500 year old problem, at least. We don't know exactly the date, but I like these ones because it motivates before we even had invented algebra, they had no choice but to write it down in a rhetoric sentence. And then, okay, you can go. Now that we have the power of algebra, we will be able to solve these systems systematically and get the answers that magically appear or that they would spend hours looking at it. We can just systematically phrase this as a linear system and augment the matrix and then find out whether we have solutions. What we're also going to find out along the way is, and you'll hear me say it, so I'm going to say it one more time before I start this one. Turns out no matter how many equations you have and how many unknowns you have, or what we call the size of our linear system, there is only ever one solution, no solution, or infinitely many solutions. This is the options we have for the types of solutions. In this problem, they don't know this several thousand years ago. So when they're solving them, the guy that first does this states three positive solutions. I actually found four non-negatives, but one of them has where you don't have any of the roosters, I believe, and it wanted one of each kind, I think. So you want positive solutions so that you get one of each of these. So what does it say? So it says a single cock. Uh, technically, yes, okay. Cock was the word they used in the original one. This is a rooster, but we'll use rooster if you want. So the kids can watch. A single cock is worth five xian. A hen is worth three xian, and three chicks are only worth one xian, which means there is a conversion there for your brain. If we reverse that, they should have been nice and phrased that as one chick is one third Xi'an. But that'll come up right away when I show you this. And then the problem is why it's called the hundreds fowl problem is you're supposed to buy a hundred birds with a hundred Xi'an. And then they want you to, this is their cryptic way of phrasing it, but I put it sort of the way that they phrased it before. In each case, find the number of roosters, hens, and chicks. So it wants to know, is there only one solution? Solving it means the same thing it did now as it did a couple thousand years ago when we say solve it we mean find all the solutions not some of them or most of them we want all of them and now what I'm saying with this is he lists three positive solutions and this is going to be phrased inside of a, eventually a linear system and there can only be one solution no solutions or infinitely many solutions and he gives three so there can't be one and he's given three, so there can't be none. So that means actually the way that when, when, once he phrases, there will be infinitely many solutions to this problem, only three of which have a positive complete solution. And that's where we're going to get the three solutions that he gets from this. What are they? Let me cheat and then I'll list them for you. The first solution is four roosters, 18 hens, and 78 chicks. Another solution that he lists is eight roosters, 11 hens, and 81 chicks. And then the final solution that he gives is 12, and you can see up that they're increasing by multiples or decreasing. And then this is 12 roosters, 4 hens, and 84 chicks. So, yeah, exactly. I just cheated and looked and wrote them down from the historical document, but... We will give a systematic way of generating these eventually, but we'll have to learn along the way how to phrase our mathematical game of finding all the infinitely many solutions and then recouching it inside a real world problem to find the integer whole solutions, which would make sense for finding actual number of birds that we want. How does he actually do this? And where is the 
third solution where you can find zero roosters and then some number of something and then some number of chicks and how can I get that one maybe you don't want to buy any roosters well without roosters you can't really produce any more so they probably wanted one of each at least let's at least phrase this in the system that we're going to use and then in the videos to come is how we're actually going to solve these all right so long story short we take the information from the sentences we're given and I rephrase it in more modern terms so we don't call them fowls anymore probably it's a, I need a, to buy a hundred birds and I need to use a hundred dollars once I have that phrase in the terminology that I have the other thing I need to do is say that I need to give terminology for something for simplicity and you'll see when we do start using systems I used X and Y or XYZ and then we're gonna have to start indexing possibly but when you can use the same ones and it'll look the same always so I'm gonna call X the number of roosters I'm gonna call Y the number of hens and I'm gonna let Z equal the number of unknown chicks. This is classically what we do to describe unknown variables in our problem. Once we have these three unknown variables and I call them something X, Y, Z, I now have to take this sentence which I erase, but you can go look back and try and do this for yourself if you want. In this case, when we read the sentences, we get an indeterminate system. What that means is we have not enough information to solve uniquely for everybody because it didn't give me enough information in the system originally. I have three unknowns, but from the sentences, if you look back, we're only going to be able to generate two equations from that scenario. So I'm going to have less equations than the unknowns, and so I can never uniquely find each person, so there will be a free variable and there will be infinitely many solutions, and then we'll find the positive solutions that work of those not today I'm just gonna set it up but this is what we're gonna do now that I had X and Y and Z are my variables it said it wants us to have a hundred birds for a hundred dollars that means first of all X plus Y plus Z has to equal 100 because that's the number of birds I want and then it also says now I have to do some multiplication factors I only have a hundred dollars so this one is also going to equal 100, but what is this one going to be? This will be the cost of roosters, the cost of hens, and the cost of chicks. And so I don't know how many I have. So the cost of the roosters is going to be $5 per rooster for the number of roosters that I end up having. It'll be $3 for the number of hens. And then it's going to be one third. So we already have, and I like this one also because in the first ones we always give you, we give you whole numbers and there's never, yeah, this one already from the real world had fractions in the setup of the equation. And then now what this is, is we have three unknowns, but now we only have two equations, two pieces of information. So in the videos to come, what we're going to see is this is indeterminate and there can never be a unique solution for this. So that either there's a contradiction, which there isn't, or there's infinitely many solutions. From those infinitely many solutions, we'll find three solutions generated several thousand years ago. Please subscribe right here, hit the notification bell. I'll see you next time.